Hey writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. We're your hosts, Stephanie McGrath and Joni DiPlacido. So this episode, we talked to Andrew David McDonald about his debut novel, When We Were Vikings, which released earlier this year. Yeah, he came into the office to chat to us. He was really lovely. It was a great interview. He talked a lot about craft and writing, gave tips on actually finishing your debut if you're just getting started. And if you have read his book and you're interested, like I was, on what he's working on next, he gives us a little hint about what you can expect from him in the future. It was a great interview. We hope you enjoy it as much as we do. So please keep listening. So we're here with Andrew David McDonald. Thank you for coming, Andrew. Thank you for having me. He's a Canadian author who has just published his debut novel, When We Were Vikings. Can you start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. I grew up in Edmonton, and I lived there until I was 18. Then I skedaddled to North Bay, um, northern Ontario, to live with my family. And um, there I kind of... Uh, fell into a group of, I guess you'd call them, drama kids who um, were much cooler than my jock friends. And I ended up um, really falling in love with the favorite book of my best friend, which was The World According to Garp. And I started writing after that. And then, so your book, When We Were Vikings, published this week. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a a long, twisty process. How has this week been for you? Good, but... But a lot of the things kind of happen off stage. I sit at home with my cat and <laughs> drink coffee, and out there in the world, the book kind of kind of sails on its own journey. So all the exciting stuff seems to happen away from me. <laughs> so the only exciting thing was seeing it in bookstores, which was a really surreal experience. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about how you became a published author? How was your writing journey? Sure. Have you been writing your whole life? How did that go? Yeah, I guess I started when I was 18 or 19 and just kind of futzing around. I didn't intend on being published. I was a big reader, read a lot of fantasy and sci-fi when I was a kid. But then when I went to college, I kind of fell into English because it was kind of the subject I was the best at. And there I took a creative writing class at uh, Western in London, Ontario. And from there I did uh, a master's in English. I taught for a bit. Um, and then I started publishing short stories, which I think a lot of a lot of um, kind of newbie writers cut their teeth on. You get to learn about structure, style, editing. Um, and then I wrote probably five novels that I didn't show anybody, um, kind of using the lessons from writing short stories. I did an MFA um, in the U.S. at uh, Amherst in Massachusetts, and that's kind of where the book started to take shape. And that was kind of um, the process from being a writer who kind of sits at home, you don't really interact with people, Mm -hmm. to now having to think about the business. The business end of things was really jarring. I was kind of lucky to have a few published writer friends who could kind of, you know, guide me on the process of how do you find an agent? How do books get published? And then... I thought I knew how the whole process worked, and then when my book got got picked up by Scout, my publisher, and Simon & Schuster, then I learned a whole bunch more that I had no idea about the industry behind the veil, marketing, publicity, uh, how covers get made, <laughs> uh, then it was more editing, and the editing process after I'd finished, or thought I'd finished, took another probably eight months, or nine months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there were still tweaks to be made. So yeah, that's kind of the journey. I started with short stories. That kind of opened the door to getting in touch with some agents and editors, but mostly it was making the transition from from short stories to a novel was the big leap. Um, And if I had to do it again, I don't know, maybe I'd write a million novels and throw them in the trash instead of a million short stories. (laughs) Okay. Because they're kind of of different beasts. But Yeah. yeah, and... But... I love short stories, so I don't want to besmirch them, um, still write them, so, yeah. What were some of the things that you didn't know, or that you maybe wish you had known before you went into this process? Writing short stories as kind of a starting point, there's a lot of emphasis, or I, I, I put a lot of emphasis on sentence level writing, and, you know, beautiful writing being stylistic, and I found that when working with a larger book, 
structure and storytelling were kind of more important in a lot of ways. And so that's what I, I wish I had started writing novels earlier, trying to write novels. You know, like Nano Remo. I did Nano. That was my first. Um, <laughs> we have tried. I have tried. Yeah, and yeah. I do it. We got a group of actual writers who the deal is that we all have to do our Nano Remo project in a genre that we don't write in. Oh. So <laughs> I've written like a romance novel, a horror novel, a sci-fi novel, and they're all really bad. But I wish I'd have started writing kind of longer work concurrent to short stories. Like I, st I wish I would have done like Nano Remo right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because it's a long slog to even finish a first draft, which you guys, if you've tried to do Nano Remo, mm. like that, failed pretty bad. How far did you get? Like not even a page. I was stuck in the idea. How is well, this going to work? That's a big problem. Yeah. Um, the thing I read that kind of changed it for me was Anne Lamott, Bird by Bird, okay. mm, which okay. is an amazing, an, an amazing uh, kind of book about writing. But I've also friends I know who don't write love it. And she has an essay called, am I allowed to use the S word on this yeah, show? Yeah. Uh, Shitty First Drafts. And it's all about kind of that, that kind of challenge of you're kind of afraid to start because you want to be perfect. And there's always a point midway through whatever you're working on where there's like this pretty new idea over there and you want to drop what you're doing because it suddenly become hard. But what you don't realize, which is the, the great tragedy, is in the middle of the new thing, you'll get another idea. And you'll be like, mm -hmm. this is the one that I can I can do. I can drop this project. And you end up with like 50 first 100 pages mm -hmm. uh, instead of one finished book that you can then edit. Yeah. Did you run into that with this book? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I wrote the first draft and I showed it to uh, some readers. And I have one really smart reader who's not a writer. She's a reader. And that's super important. She's... She's a lawyer. She doesn't have time for books that are boring. She doesn't care about, you know, she's the, the kind, the perfect kind of reader because she's passionate about reading, but also doesn't have writer hangups. So I showed it to her and she said, well, you know, I like the first hundred pages, but how the story goes, I like this minor storyline mm. way better. So I think you should rewrite your entire book oh, God. <laughs> from that small storyline. And, you know, that's that's pretty harrowing to hear. But she really has great taste, is really every reader, every writer should have a reader like her. And for me, she's my reader I have in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, well, let's give that a try. And then <laughs> I did. And that, I kept the first hundred pages, and then I wrote, whatever, 200 more. And in the middle of it, I thought... Why don't I just write a space romance with my boss? <laughs> and why not? I well, exactly. <laughs> except I started writing a space romance about robots, and in the middle of it, I thought maybe that well, maybe that book wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. And so I did. I, I cheated on the robot book, went back to the old book, and thought, well, this actually isn't as bad as the robot book is now. And it was this process of going back and forth between these two two books that. The only reason I had, I finished this one is because I could go to the other one and be like, oh, the robot book's better. And then I hate it and then go back to this one. It was only that sort of like if you, if you want to do something in life and you're a big procrastinator, you want to have something you want to yes. do even less than <laughs> yeah. the procrastination from the first one, you know, gets, gets the second one, which you actually need to do done. But yeah, there was endless novels started in the middle of this one and this one just held on to my heart so I kept I kept coming back to it can you tell our listeners about your debut novel what's it about sure um, so the narrator of my of my novel's name is Zelda and she's a um, 21 year old Viking enthusiast who's on the fetal alcohol spectrum and she lives with her brother Gert in kind of a low income neighborhood and she finds out that he's up to sort of nefarious means to keep the family finances afloat. And so she takes it upon herself to write her own Viking legend um, to save her brother from the, the kind of neighborhood drug trade. And kind of in the process of that, uh, become legendary herself. Um, so that that's sort of the broad strokes. 
we were interested um how did you approach zelda's narrative voice mm -hmm. like, yeah that's a great question so there are two ways of kind of answering that question and one is like technically mm -hmm. how you how you kind of create a voice like that and create mm -hmm. a character like that as kind of a craftsperson so maybe i'll 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 answer that second but okay. the the novel kind of came out of a short story that was from her brother's perspective originally okay and i i assume that's a question that I might, question that later, might yeah. be okay well we, we all just we can come back to that but and she had a voice but the vikings wasn't a part of her voice back then okay. so once i started writing fragments technically speaking the most important thing was her own filter to see the world and her, it wasn't Vikings at first. She wasn't a Viking enthusiast until I became a Viking I was enthusiast. Say, are and then, you? <laughs> well, a lot of really cool stuff related to Vikings has been happening recently. So I'm, I now am compulsively following Viking world news. But her idiom, the way she sees the world, her word of the day, her use of swear words, which had to be creative and one editorial note was more of one of her particular swear words she thought that uh, okay. i needed more of this swear word but not that swear word but the the kind of technical challenges of creating a voice was figuring out how this human being sees the world right and i think if any of us had our had something jacked into our brains where we our internal monologue was you know He's in a movie that everybody's watching. Oh, Truman Show? Truman yeah. Show, right. If you had a Truman Show and an audience was kind of following your interior monologue, you'd probably find something, a, a pattern of thinking and a way mm -hmm. of looking at the world similar to Zelda with Vikings. Vikings became kind of a shorthand for how to kind of structure a chaotic world. And I think that's, that's a pretty universal feeling. Um, some people use religion. They see the world through the filter of religion. Some people are hopeless romantic. Some people are pessimists. So finding out how her her kind of approach to the world was kind of the key and then her pet expressions and how she the the way she communicates with those she loves and how that differs from you know those she doesn't quite know the inside jokes i think that's in terms of craft and how you how you get voice in writing and make characters really idiosyncratic um that that's kind of how you do it um a, a, a title that people have compared it to is uh, Silver Linings Playbook. And the book has Pat Peoples working out constantly. He's always talking about like doing a thousand sit-ups and talking about uh, how he's relentlessly optimistic. He's got this Silver Linings Playbook and there's also the language of football. So that's a way that um, he's not just a guy who's just been released from a psychiatric facility. He's somebody who has this, had to craft this worldview to deal with the a world that's chaotic, inhumane, and cruel. Um, so that's sort of how her how her her voice came along is finding that, asking as like a person, what her what her filter and how she sees the world, mm -hmm. and that's different from a lot of other characters have similar worldviews that aren't quite so obvious uh, as I see the world as Vikings, and just like I think all of us, she has to she eventually comes to question. Well, how how neatly does a very nuanced and complicated world fit into a really rigid structure of rules. That so that that's sort of the part of the arc of the book. And on a similar kind of vein, um, so you were writing from the perspective of somebody who thinks differently to you. Did you use a sensitivity reader? Or did you work with? No, I'm not even sure sensitivity readers existed mm -hmm. okay. when I when I started the book. Mm -hmm. My guiding principle, and I think this is a good one for anybody writing about anything, is to see the, the character you're writing about as a human. Mm -hmm. um, which is to say, part of, part of the, the, the arc of Zelda and self-actualization is kind of pointing out that, look, here's the person that the world is inclined to see as... Um, defective in some way let's say and all these people around her are ostensibly not defective they're ostensibly normal using square quotes scare quotes but as the book progresses she turns out to be the most humane courageous uh, 
self-actualized, <laughs> loyal um, character in the book. And so what you have is this question of, well, who, why, why do we see her as limited when these other characters who you might be inclined to say don't have these disadvantages he, she has, they don't have the advantages she has as a courageous person with strong moral values who is tremendously loyal to those around her. Mm -hmm. So to, to kind of circle back to the question of sensitivity readers, um, I thought that instead of kind of trying to get this condition, I'm doing scare quotes again, <laughs> speaking slowly uh, as if it's italics on, you know, instead of getting this character with this condition right, it's more that this is a this is a character that isn't a condition. This mm -hmm. is a, a human who has hopes, dreams, failures, successes in the same way we all do. Um, and so there were I, I did get a lot of a lot of reader feedback because the last thing you want to do is my biggest fear was that I I I wanted this character to be a person and that and somebody that you could fall in love with with and one thing I've I, a lot of readers have said is that well I started the book thinking this person's really different from you but she's actually not mm -hmm. she has her fears are very universal they're fears I have and there are there are ways that she handles challenges in her life that I'm a total failure at handling in my own life <laughs> that I think is is my favorite my favorite part about her is that she she takes problems that are really daunting and acts courageously and there are times when I think we all wish we could be more like that yeah she really does run straight in and yeah she's not afraid of some yeah. stuff which it kind of gets into our question about so kind of some of the most comedic elements in the book I found mm -hmm. was like talking about sex yeah and how Often we don't find that people with mental mental disability talk about sex, and like, was that an outset you oh, wanted to talk about in the book? It's or? Very timely, very timely question. Um, se the sex, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So the short story, it came, the short story it came from was only about the sex scene. The short story oh. was about the bro a brother oh. who had to take care of somebody and. She wanted to have sex, and she was asking him for advice. It opens with them at an underwear store shopping for a boyfriend. So that was the original short story, which I think I'd written, like, probably probably eight years ago. But this is an interesting question, and there, there, are, a couple, there are a couple of elements to the, my thinking on kind of how, to, how, to, how and why to include a sex scene. One is that uh, there's a tremendous amount of abuse in at-risk groups. And that was something I found that as I was re researching fetal alcohol syndrome, which I'm from Alberta and it's, it's very, it's very prevalent there is that especially people with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome who are born to low income families, uh, who end up in, in foster care, there's a tremendous amount of people, not just sexually, but a lot of, um, in a lot of ways being exploited mm -hmm. and so that was the uh, the idea of how to kind of maybe shine a bit of a spotlight on that. That was that was important, but more so the questions about her and sex. This might loop back to what what I was just saying is she's a human being. Human beings love. They're attracted to others. They have their hearts broken. Sex is messy. Uh, you know the comedic element of kind of her first sexual experience. Um, I don't know a single person whose first mm -hmm. sexual experience <laughs> wasn't a complete disaster in some way. Um, and that, the, that's an interesting, an interesting note that if she didn't have fetal alcohol syndrome, and if that was just a regular <laughs> debacle, would we be, how would we be discussing it, right? Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, she's she's just like all of us. Yeah. She's it's her first sexual encounter. She doesn't have a mother or a father to ask. Well, how does this work? 
Instead, she has a brother who's a functional alcoholic who is very awkward and a dude and a best friend who's trying to trying to help her. But just like all of us, she she's entering into this universal part of human experience as best as she can. And one final thing that only occurred to me in the last couple of weeks as I've been talking about the book is she's kind of in an interesting position because her boyfriend is probably intellectually not at her level. Mm -hmm. But she's also, a, you might say, a bit um, perhaps behind many others intellectually while she has other advantages. Mm -hmm. So the prospect of dating and meeting other people is uniquely challenging to her. And that makes it even more kind of messy and confusing and comical at times, but also really sad at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that scene was so real. Oh, it yeah. was just, it was very, very real, very relatable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you talked about the research process briefly because mm -hmm. you were into Vikings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what was the process like for the book? Was it as you went along, you're like, I need to know about Vikings or... You nailed it. Um, so I, th I don't actually like historical research. And I thought, okay, what's the best way to do the Viking thing um, and not want to stick my head in a blender? <laughs> and my solution was I would learn along with Zelda. Okay. So there were, I would go along and I'd be like, okay, today we're working on this scene. And I wonder if there is what, this isn't a spoiler. Somebody <laughs> at the end is hospitalized and could possibly die and maybe does, no spoilers. But I got to that scene and I thought, how, how would Zelda approach grief? And the potential of death of a loved one. And so I thought, well, how do Vikings do that? And I found this really weird detail about a boat made of fingernails. Um, and I, I thought, that is the strangest mythological thing I can put into this scene. Um, and so she, oh, I don't want to spoil it, but she, she starts clipping the individual's fingernails. And I love that scene. I, I know. Had no, okay. no, no spoilers. <laughs> no toilets. Um, but that was an example of, of just thinking, okay, a, a, a challenge is presented in her life. And her, her capacity to deal with that, that problem is often filtered through Vikings. Just like, let's say you were of a particular religious domination and mm -hmm. you're faced with a societal challenge, you're faced with something at work, you're faced with an existential crisis, moral crisis, you'd, you'd turn back to say that religion or let's say you were um you know um, had a particular value system that you learned let's say you were a type a business corporate personality when you're faced with grief you might turn to that value system and see okay how do i take this value system and apply it to this super traumatic complicated part of your life so i just learned along as she did Something would come along, and I'd say, "Oh, how would a, how would somebody into Vikings look into or or kind of manage this scene through Viking mythology?" Do you have any tips for authors struggling to finish or start their first book? You bet. <laughs> um, oh yeah, yeah, I do. I have a lot. I actually was bored one morning and wrote an epically long Goodreads <laughs> advice to aspiring writers. Oh, that's thing. good. Oh, that's great. That was we'll just that. like out of control, and I got excited because I, I love this question. I love asking writers. I still do. As I meet writers who are established and not established, I love asking them about how they work. I love the craft. And I always found it frustrating when I was working on my book, asking for pragmatic tips. And I would get responses that were kind of vague and esoteric and, you know, sounded... Um, like philosophical and I said no I just want to finish the book just tell me tell me how to finish the book so one of the things that I learned for me and I think a lot of my friends who are writers who are finishing their books who have you know published what what they seem to share obviously is the love of reading and that that goes without saying um, second is you know writing the kind of book that you like that you like to read um, but third which is going to have 
a million subclauses is one I think is writing at the same time every day mm-hmm. and writing for word count not time and the reason why I say that is when you write for time like people have jobs especially if you're writing your first book you have a job you don't have you have you don't have a lot of time but you might have a window of time so you can't be ambitious and increase your window of time but what you can do is say okay I have an hour before the kids wake up before I have to go to work before I have to go to Kobo whatever <laughs> for me it's feed my hellacious cat um, you have what you can do is work to increase your word count today and I was really slow when I first started writing my goal was a hundred words I would say okay I've got an hour before I have to go teach or whatever I'm gonna try to do a hundred words and that hundred words at first was brutal it w- took an hour and then I once I had a couple weeks of that I'd say okay let's do 200 and a funny thing happens is as soon as you get to a non-even word count so I think in terms of 250 words which is like the page mm-hmm. that's what they say so I would get to 200 and say okay that's almost a page why should I why should I stop so I would be, I built up my word count and I think most writers I talk to they aim for a thousand words which if you're consistently building up words you can finish your book no problem especially if you do a page a day in a year you'd have a novel even if and even if you're doing just a page a day one of the the other pieces of advice that someone gave me and I, I was kind of talking to my editor about this is a novel such a long slog that as you're doing it you're picking up the skills you need to do it mm-hmm. and in my experience the the kind of personal growth that's not specific to writing um, writing a novel kind of was its own kind of self-help um, for me uh, I was big into outlines I was not comfortable you know not knowing what would happen next And the problem with that is the book will kind of teach you how to write it as you go through. But if it's your first time doing it, you haven't published a book, you're like, oh, it's going off the rails. But that's actually where the the book needs to go. Mm -hmm. And if you get all zen woo-woo about it, (laughs) you think, well, that sounds an awful lot about my, my personal and work life. Like, you can't control everything. You want to plan for everything, but then you'll get a curveball. And your your first reaction is, Okay, how do I how do I control this off the rails and pull it back? And sometimes you just have to see where it goes and and so those moments everybody's pro- problem with their first book, I think, as they're going through and writing it, which readers don't see. You only see the finished process, but mm-hmm. if you ask my editor, she would say, <laughs> "Yes, sir." Yeah, there was that compulsion to control the story when it wanted to go one way. Like no, no, my these notes I made before I have to pull it back. Um, is understanding that that's okay. And the last thing is that your first draft should be right brain, like child's play. It's oh. play, and the faster you can finish your first draft, the better. One because when you start editing as you go along, you're kind of uh, imprisoning the the child's play, the part that's fun about writing a book. Mm-hmm. And if you do that too early, um, you'll never finish because you'll always be editing. Back in the day when it was quills or typewriters, <laughs> you actually couldn't save a document and go back. So you had to finish the book. Right? So letting yourself play, letting it be imperfect, like NaNoWriMo, mm-hmm. having your shitty first draft, and then going back and editing it is probably the best thing you can do. And shutting off the... The, not, the, the angry voice that says, oh, this sucks, what am I doing? Man, nobody knows what they're doing when they're, when, they're, when they're writing their book. Nobody. I'm writing my second one. I'm having the same problems. Everyone's like, we don't want to hear about your problems because you have a book coming out, you obviously know what you're doing, but I still think, oh, it's gone off the rails again. Why is there this chapter about turnips? Like, let's pull it back to the story and just having the, the faith that as you're going through it, what you'll be left with if you finish it you can work in shape and Mm -hmm. take off the child's hat and put on the grumpy adult writer hat to kind of shape it is this because you kind of cut your teeth on short stories like you have to be so tight in a short story you've got to get the plot in and explain Mm -hmm. everything so i I guess you probably had those planned 
And yeah. then when it comes, you've got more well, space to explore. That's in a an novel. interesting. That's an interesting thing. I have a big problem with short st- my short stories because they're often too big. Mm. That was a. I've, I've published a, a fair amount, but the consistent rejection is always. This is just way too big. Okay, mm-hmm. they're like one moment, like the New Yorker stories. Like they used to say, the New Yorker story is. It takes place in one place at one time, and it moves forward in real time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and then there are explosions, and then they move to Tahiti, (laughs) and then there's, like, tax fraud. And consistently it would say, okay, this feels more like a novel. This doesn't feel like a short story. I kind of like big, explodey stories. I like, you know, happenings. I'm not terribly good at these quiet moments, even though I I, I hope I have some good ones, but... I'm I'm very attracted to stories that operate with cause and effect. One thing leads to another, which leads to another. In short stories, it's often hard to to have more than one of those. It's mm-hmm. often a cause and effect. The other thing about short stories is they're a good way to teach yourself how to be free and finish a draft and go from start to finish. Because if it's a debacle and a terrible short story and a complete failure... You've used maybe however long it took you, like a week, a month. But a book, take you can't just say, oh, I'll throw it away. I'll throw this draft away and start again. Mm. And you're like, well, that there goes like a year and a half. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think specific to me and specific to uh, the outlining and stuff like that, I grew up in kind of a, a neighborhood pretty similar to the neighborhood Zelda lived in. And there was a lot of chaos around And that's, I played sports, I wrestled when I was a teenager, and part of, um, part of managing that chaos was always having something really regimented, Um, like, oh, there's always a tournament, and then I could follow these steps. If I was perhaps more studious, or I was into chess, or whatever, that would be a way to, to kind of structure chaos. To do the other example, I have a really good friend who's, who's writing her book, and her brain is like Jackson Pollock. (laughs) <laughs> she is so imaginative. Her book is amazing, but holy cow, it's it's a constellation. And whereas I need more of that as a writer, I have to watch to make sure I give myself space to play and make a mess. She has a lot of trouble um, applying kind of structural logic to her novel. She has the opposite problem. Um, she, she, let's say you grow up in a household that's very rigid and a lot of rules. Your natural inclination when you're expressing yourself creativity, creatively might be to break all of those. Mm-hmm. And it creates a lot of beauty, but it also makes it difficult when you have to start applying this, uh, this, you know, the logical system that you might have rebelled against. And for me, it was, like I said, the opposite. I had a super chaotic upbringing, but... Um, and so I, I found a lot of um, kind of managing that chaos with structure, with sports, with, you know, always having goals, very like, mm-hmm. yay, and self-help. Oh, my God, I'm addicted to it. <laughs> but <laughs> just that, that sort of like... But then there comes a point when you have to play, when you have to say, okay, I, I spilled the ink Let's see how it shapes out. And being okay with saying, whoa, that came out differently. Maybe now I can shape it, but I need you need that space to kind of let mm-hmm. it go. I think something you said earlier kind of stuck with me about when you were writing short stories, it was very much about sentence level, mm-hmm. like writing beautiful sentences. Mm-hmm. And I imagine that when it comes to writing a novel and then you've got this whole overwhelming like length of structure, it's great to have that training of already being really good at putting the sentence level stuff together. Yeah, and that... That it, it's an interesting conundrum. I was talking to my I had breakfast with my editor this morning, and we were talking about um, beautiful sentences and beautiful stylists. And she said something very interesting. She said when she gets a book and reads a book, she can always tell when a book's overworked, when yeah. it's it, it's almost like a coiled spring. And I read a lot of a lot of novels from friends, aspiring writers, and things like that. And the first twenty five pages are always so tight; mm. they do not breathe. And one of my old writing mentors gave me a piece of advice that you don't think works until you try it. I was really agonizing over a paragraph. 
and oh my god, it was so beautiful. I'm such a genius, and there's <laughs> metaphors, there's like allusions to Walt Whitman, and I'm a genius. And every reader was who read this short story said, "What's what's going on there, man? Like what? <laughs> like what? I don't understand what's going on." I was like, "No, I'm a genius. What are you talking about?" And eventually, I realized, okay, instead of like tweaking every little sentence. My, my my first writing mentor said, well, why don't you just cut the paragraph and say he walked into a room? Ooh. And I was like, well, you might be a published writer, but I'm referencing Walt Whitman. Um, <laughs> but I did because everybody consistently said, okay, this is super pretentious. Like, I really don't care about your musings of the Great Void. I want to know what happened to this character. This character walked into a room. There were like four people there and there was like some romantic triangle and we don't really care about Walt Women. We love Walt Women, but we don't need we don't need to this is completely irrelevant. So to to kind of expand this, I found that the times when I wasn't trying to be a fancy pants and I thought, okay, this scene, like the sex scene you're talking about, this is super complicated. My brain is hurting from trying to get everything perfect. Oh my god, I'm on my like fourth edit of this super nuanced, complicated scene that could explode and destroy my brain. Uh, I'm going to start a new document and I'm just going to, I'm not going to think, I'm just going to give the the play by play. It's not a play by play sex scene, but I get it. (laughs) I'll, I'll write the scene naturally and I'll purposely be like, I'm not, this isn't the scene. These are just my notes for the scene. Mm, Okay. And the funny thing is all the parts that people like are the things that I wrote when I wasn't thinking that I was like, oh, I'm told my editor's going to be like, you sound like you're illiterate. Why don't you <laughs> learn how to write? And this, is, those were universally the scenes that readers liked and universally the scenes that they were like, okay, Shakespeare, put away the, <laughs> put, put that away was the scenes that I overworked. I wanted to make beautiful. I my first writing workshop there was a football player in the um, in the class and he was totally stuck out like a sore thumb there were <laughs> drama majors and there was the the person who wanted to be a writer there was all these people in this these uh, this class and he told the funniest stories because he wrote the way he spoke mm. and I find that oftentimes writers if they do that they're better off than when they decide they're writers and suddenly they're fancy and then once they get through that they somehow end up closer to the way you'd speak conversationally Mm -hmm. but oftentimes you have to go through the I'm imitating I did I had the Salman Rushdie phase followed by the Brett Easton (laughs) Ellis phase which if you've read both of those writers it's like maximalist writing to like Joan Didion no adornments whatsoever and I went through those back to back and was like, I don't know what I'm doing. But eventually, if you stop stop trying to be impressive and realize you're telling a story, um, those parts of those parts of your book or your story or whatever, th- they're often quietly the best writing you're doing. Uh, since we're at the start of the decade. Where do you see stories in publishing in the next 10 years? Or where do you hope to see it? Oh, my God. I thought we were doomed. Uh, <laughs> I thought there were, there were, there was, there was so much we're doomed. And when I was, when I was maybe 10 years ago and I decided I'm going to be a writer, uh, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty depressing. However, I got a job teaching high school in high school English, um, probably eight years ago and that that changed everything and I recently taught a middle school class and taught a kind of a writing thing and I did like this interactive how do you build a story and I watched these kids build stories that basically I could take to my agent and say I found you like your next 15 bestsellers (laughs) and I thought what happens to to these to children what will happen to these children that will eviscerate this imagination this love for storytelling I couldn't believe it I, I, I was the, the imposter I was like this is how you write stories and they're like actually they're elves okay and I was like okay <laughs> and it's actually a metaphor for 
international migration. And I was like, you're middle school and you're already a genius. So working with younger people is what, what changed it for me. And they, there's something about their reading, I think, has reclaimed its position as rebellious, as anti-authoritarian, as if mainstream culture so digitized and narcissistic and bite-sized the reaction to that has has been a renewed love of reading and i've watched i worked for um a bookstore here in toronto that no longer exists it's called nicholas Hoare, a long time ago and it was beautiful and it closed and i was like that's it that's the end of the world <laughs> but since then i've watched um Canadian writer Michelle Berry opened a bookstore in Peterborough and um, a couple American writers and Patchett opened one in I think Texas and um, I'm seeing more and more uh, this this return to the idea of reading as um, empowering and that was I didn't see that coming I'm regrettably a pessimist and <laughs> optimism's hard so if I'm optimistic, that means it's probably even better because I, I'm downgrading. But seeing these young people, and these are young people, by the way, who not the, not the middle schoolers, but the, the high school kids I taught and then the freshmen I taught, these were people who um, had gone through that, that low attention span, uh, phone addictions in their own lives. And I, I saw them in class. I did an exercise where I said, okay... Uh, I will drop the last essay off this class if you can make there's a three three classes uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday if you can make through all three with no phones and no computers out if I see one phone or one computer out you also write the essay what a great deal well I was going to wave it anyways mm -hmm. but I wanted what happened was it became it became a way to talk about their relationship to technology and how they felt so the, one of the students who was studying to be a journalist got like alcoholic DTs being away from his phone. And wow. he stopped in the middle of the work in the class and said, so I know we're, we're, we're like talking about Oxford commas, but <laughs> I'm, I just want to say like, I'm feeling like really nervous. And a couple other students said, I'm feeling really nervous. And it became sort of a, um, a, self-galvanizing return to solitude to imagination and they a lot I said they had an option to do a final writing project which was just okay what happened when you went through these classes what'd you mm -hmm. learn the one of the most interesting ones was this superstar athlete football player the most popular person in school and the kind of student that doesn't pay attention to class not a big reader and his essay was so insightful about how he, how the only time he feels like he has any solitude is when he's in this particular play in football when he ha he can't think he has to you know do whatever and he said that's sort of what I want in my life and I said well you know what that is you get that in reading and reading went from this thing that people were forcing him to do to now this thing that's self-enriching and the book he chose to write to read and loved which blew my mind is Shantaram which oh, is a wow. million pages yeah, long yeah it's a beast he, he's like yeah and you know there's these drug dealers and it's India <laughs> and like these there's drug smuggling and I'm like yeah and, and then he, he starts talking about like you know I don't like poetry but like and I was like well you're big into hip hop. Why don't you try looking at lyrics and see what you can do with lyrics? Mm -hmm. And then, he, um, and it became it became a, a way to reconnect with 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 literature. the The publishing industry in general, um, I think there's never been more independent presses. I'm I'm published by a big five publisher, but there's never been more independent publishers, and there's never been more opportunities for debut writers. It's really the best time in history to be a debut writer. And when I was writing this book, everyone was like, publishing is dead. And a friend of mine got 
a lovely book deal. Another friend got a lovely book deal. And I thought, this is if, if, if everything's dead, maybe I'm just in the weirdest orbit where all the, all the complete flukes are happening. Or, or maybe we should be really hopeful. And hopeful about readers, about a renewed interest in fiction, about a nonfiction too. And in this crazy time when, like, the, I just talked to my cab driver about the coronavirus for like 20 minutes. <laughs> and I was just like, you know what I would like to read not about the coronavirus, to read something that uplifts me. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's really radical. That's a radical that's a radical aspect of literature and the young readers are using literature like that. They really are. They're saying, I'm tired of, you know, bite-sized thoughts. I'm feeling this impinge on my humanity and they're returning to books they love. I think YA, the YA, like I read John Green for the first time and wept when I read, um, Oh, get out of here. And, <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. We and all cried. I thought, this is teaching young people how to be human. Mm-hmm. And what they're gonna what they're gonna say is, this book taught me how to be human. Not this tweet, not this movie, not this TV oh, yeah. show. Though they can they can do that too, but I became as a thirty five year old dude, this terminally ill girl in love with somebody else who's terminally ill. And as a final note on John Green, <laughs> that author, I was like, never be like that guy. The the drunken Scandinavian guy. I oh, said, yeah. oh, never. If anyone asks me about anything, I'm not going to be that guy. But I think when you're touched by a book the way, say, that does, at a younger age, you you associate this, this self-understanding, this like, okay, people die people fall in love the world's super complicated but this book taught me something about myself and how to deal with this stuff do you remember the first book that affected you like that yep oh yeah 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 Yeah. um so i i the first book i read for pleasure was margaret atwood surfacing and i was like what is going on yeah (laughs) and it's one of those like old school canadian books where you're like like she's at a park and i'm just okay I read Duddy Kravitz, um, which is another old school Canadian book. And that was based on a course. And I, I kind of felt similar because Duddy Kravitz comes from a you know low income background. He wants to make it so bad. But the book that shattered me and really made me like it, 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 it devastated me. And it's I'm still surprised that I read it when I did was One Flew of the Goose Nest. And there's a lot of problems politically with the book, but. I had a family member who was institutionalized and she gave me the book. She went through ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. mm -hmm. And she gave me this book. And if you've ever read it, when you open it, it's so confusing because there's this person and he's hallucinating. But you don't, you're like, wait, are you in like a giant robot factory? Like what's happening? (laughs) And just the, the, um, rebellion against dehumanizing forces these you are ill you need to be you're different you're ill you're contrary to the norm in society you have to be put into a box you have to be re-educated you have to be just like everybody else and then the the discovery in those dark dehumanizing places of this human element of yourself which is messy, which is passionate, which sometimes, you know, makes uncouth jokes, especially Jack, played by Jack Nicholson. <laughs> um, but this book was such an affirmation of just when young people ask me about reading books like that, where I say, just like the, the John Green book we mentioned, which is like, you're going to die. We're all going to die. Yeah. There's no getting around that. And that's a very, very scary thing to see. Similarly, we all feel, especially when we're younger, but let me tell younger people, it doesn't stop as you age. You feel alienated at work. You feel, everybody wants me to be dressed like this, talk like this. Maybe you're not institutionalized in a psych ward, but that book changed 
the mental health industry. And I, I think it's the mental health industrial complex where essentially the, the, the most human have to be sent back to the factory to be reprogrammed. And I read that book first 50 pages. I'm like, I don't know what the hell is going on, but I kept going. I kept going. And by the end I was like, I want to go cure cancer. I want to, I want to go become the president of Canada. I want to do something so alive and human and outrageous and imperfect and in spite of, in the face of, no, you have to sit at your desk and behave. That book was the one that just cracked me open. What are you working on next? Is Gert getting his own novel? Oh, whoa, no one's asked me that. Um, I, I'm working, I'm just about finished a book, an, a novel that's not in the same, the, the characters in this book aren't a part of it, but it's the same tone, same kind of universe. I guess you can say earlier I was talking about how Zelda sees the world and its Vikings. Mm -hmm. The worldview of, wow, there's some dark stuff going on, but let's try to be human and alive. It's just, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, so I'm I'm trying to finish that, and it's all, I'm on draft four, which there you go, many many drafts, <laughs> um, and I hope to get it into my my publishing people soon. But I'm also mulling a sequel, and I actually know exactly what happens. Ooh, what's it about? I need to know. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, I was interested that Gar you were originally telling. Gar yeah, story. that makes sense to me. Yeah, when I was reading it. Well. I feel Spoilers. like I can say this. It's my career. Whatever. I can say whatever I we want. We can take it out later. If it you gets know. But I, my dad died when I was in my 20s. And I was away. Like, I was in Toronto and he was in Edmonton. And by the time I got home, he was cremated. And I didn't have the moment of, you know, saying goodbye and, uh, and seeing him. So in the weeks following that, months... I would sometimes dream that he wasn't dead and he was somewhere out there. And I still do sometimes in the, in the like lizard brain, I think maybe it's all a ruse. And I realized what, where is Zelda's Gert, Zelda and Gert's father? Oh. Is he out there? Where is he? Is mm -hmm. he gone? What if he comes back? Then, of course, AK-47. I love her, yeah. too. She's my favorite. She's yeah. she, I... is, she is such an A++ human. She's actually um, a bunch of my friends just stuffed into one awesome <laughs> yeah. package. But I wonder things like, okay, did Gert graduate from college? I learned to drive late, so I'm like, I wonder if Zelda learns how to drive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm a terrible driver. <laughs> uh, what happens to their father? And this is where maybe you see it in real time. I think, okay, how do Vikings look at lost paternity and lineage? Mm -hmm. And part of, I think, all of us, but Vikings too, specific to Vikings, but I think this is something we're all thinking about is... How do I get in touch with my lineage and paternity, maternity? Mm -hmm. And, of course, she's in touch with her maternity. But as I was thinking about it, I think that's a bit more complicated. And then one other thing, which I don't know if I have the chops to handle, is pregnancy mm -hmm. and raising family. And also, by the end of the book, the caretaker roles have switched. Exactly. Yeah. So what? when you extend that, how does it become more complicated how do they, does Gert rise up and become more self-sufficient? And are they mutually like yin and yanging? I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking through those things, but they're, they're people to me. So it's not like, I wonder what I can write about. It's thinking deeply about what these humans I've come to really love. Where do their lives lead? Just like if you had a friend from high school man, I wonder if that guy became a doctor or if she became a singer or whatever. She became a doctor, he became, whatever. Um, kind of that so I don't think we need to cut that we can we can I'll be that. On but the I'm thinking I'm, yeah. think, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking no I'm, about that. I'm glad to hear that because Gert, Gert definitely like I feel so bad for Gert uh, and he, he has it hard but also like it's very much Zelda's story it's not like he, you, he really does have his own life well, he's more she, me than anybody than anybody else in the story so that's why I kind of and when did you decide to change it so it wasn't well I was wasn't story. even writing a novel okay I was writing them. I was 
was writing little snippets and being like, I wonder if I can do like a sequel to the short story or develop something. And then at a certain point, I was like, whoa, this voice, Zelda's voice really took over. I'm, I want to know what happens. Um, I'm starting to get involved with these people. And that's sort of like, it sounds like a writer cliche to be like, oh, I'm in love with my characters. They're real. But th- my favorite writing, my favorite novels, my favorite fiction, even nonfiction, it, narrative nonfiction is when you when you're allowed to be these people. And this is why these kids, the, the younger readers I'm so jazzed about, and the, the Shantaram guy, is because no other medium lets you inhabit the body of somebody else and understand other people. Um, a friend had a good thought experiment, and he said, imagine two worlds. One's a world where um, students, younger students, had to spend a year trying to write about someone who's not them, trying to understand their challenges, their, their life problems. Um, how much better equipped would they be to handle a world that's so fractured and there's so much hatred? There's so much love too, but would that be a better world where, okay, uh, Johnny, you are going to write from the perspective of a 80-year-old grandmother from Sicily. And he's like, what? Mm. And he spends a year understanding what that's, what that's like. Or... Is that the better world or is the world where you only think and write about yourself? So for me, the exciting part is becoming these other people and saying, what are their lives like? And eventually you find yourself in them every time. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank yeah, you so great. much. All right. Thank you for listening to the Copa Writing Life podcast. If you're looking for Andrew David McDonald's book, we will provide a link in our show notes. And if you're looking for extra tips on how to grow your sales, visit CobaWritingLife.com. This episode was produced by Stephanie McGrath and Joni DePlachto. This episode was edited by Kelly Robotham. Music was provided by Tearjerker. And special thanks to Andrew for being a guest on our episode. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at Kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing. <laughs>